Tonight, we honor a local hero and celebrate his partner, but we begin with the doctor in the house as we talk about mental health. Roll it, Ed. You know, time has not made it any easier or more clear as we try to understand what took place in Uvalde, Texas. It was a tragedy, it is a tragedy, and now America is left to figure out the main question, why? Why would someone do something so heinous, so cowardice? So let's go inside of the mind of people who would do this kind of thing and talk about how we recover for, uh, from it. Dr. Katie Fetzer with the Wellness Studio is here with us in studio, back on set yet again. And, you know, Katie, you and I have known each other a long time. We've mm -hmm. had a number of conversations about some of the things that happen in our country that are traumatic. And this is one of the worst ones, mostly because it involves children. Right. So what we, and you are the mother of two elementary school-aged children. So this hits in multiple ways for you. Yes. Let's talk about your first reactions when you learned about what took place at the school. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, at this point, uh, collectively, people would agree that it's beyond, you know, anger and shock. I think people are just frustrated because it's not the first time this has happened. Mm -hmm. And it's gotten to this point where we're sick of seeing it happen. And it's pushing a lot of people into that state of frustration um, just with why this keeps happening again and frustration with why we can't do more to stop it from happening. You know, you've, uh, we were talking before the show about some of the work that you have done with people with mental illness that would lead them sure. to this kind of activity, specifically young people. Talk with me a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, from the place that I'm speaking with you today, um, not only am I mom of two elementary age children who are in school, but also um, I spent, for the beginning of my career, I spent close to a decade working on an adolescent psychiatric inpatient unit where very often we would be working with adolescents who were, had made threats to do something like shoot a school, bring um, guns into a school, um, threats of violence, or what we call just adolescents that have homicidal ideation. And so on a regular basis as a treatment team, we were tasked with trying to come together and determine when and if it was safe for this adolescent to be discharged from the hospital back into the community. Um, and in addition to that, uh, my research, my, specifically my dissertation research, focused on um, decision making at the policy level and really getting into the minds of legislators and senators in terms of what, how they came to um, decisions with policies affecting things such as this in mental health. What are some of the circumstances that create this mindset in young people? Yeah, that's a, absolutely a, such a big question, an important one. And it really, the, from a quote-unquote simple way to say it, is that there's this perfect storm that happens. We know that both nature and nurture come into play. So from the um, standpoint of diagnostic, you know, in, in pathology, we call it antisocial personality disorder. Okay. Um, but others might hear that as a sociopath or a psychopath, and those terms actually carry different meanings. There's a difference between the two. Um, but what makes someone a sociopath or a psychopath, really, it does involve both nature and nurture. Sometimes, Ex explain that when you what absolutely, you mean by nature and nurture. yeah. So from the nature side of it, it's biologically how we're wired. Some might say how we're born. And then on the nurture side, it's what in their environment came into play that might have shaped the person to becoming violent. And with each case that this, ha each time this happens, and with each individual. The factors might be uniquely different, but as a whole, as these cases are studied, we see similarities and commonalities across them. Um, there's experts who are studying what we call callous and unemotional traits in adolescents, which really help us to understand and follow why are some adolescents developing these callous and unemotional traits. Um, I mean, I could keep going. There's a yeah, number of I, things. Yeah, I want you to, yeah. So one of the things that, for instance, that's being studied right now, which this is just one piece of it, is with living in the digital age and how much kids are spending on screen time, it's diminished empathy development. And so they're actually doing longitudinal studies right now 
and really being able to look at how empathy is not being developed in the same way it was. For instance, it used to be that you called a child, you know, you, a kid was picked on, the kid cried, the other kid had to experience what that was like to see another kid cry and then say sorry. Whereas now, a lot of this is being done behind a screen. They're not getting the opportunities to develop empathy as much. Um, that's one factor among many. You also look at whether a child's being raised in a home environment where there's violence and abuse that's yeah. happening. Um, there's, well, you know. Hold your thought. I want to come back and talk more yes. about that and then talk about some of the solutions that we need to yeah. push toward because the country is a bit numb to this kind of thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, there were we were talking before the show, there have been more than 200 mass shootings in America this year, and we're just now into June. So it's, it's just mind-boggling to think about. We're talking with Dr. Katie Fetzer about what's happening in this country back in just a moment. Still here talking with Dr. Katie Fetzer about mental health in the aftermath of all of these mass shootings in our country this year. We were going into commercial break and you were talking about some of the factors that contribute to this callousness in our children. If you are a parent of any child, but mm -hmm. specifically elementary school aged kids right now, what is your advice to them about helping their children deal with this trauma and work through this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that one of the biggest factors is limiting how much children are seeing the news and watching the aftermath of this on the news. Um, that's one piece of it, but also really helping them to process. It's really important whenever kids witness a trauma like this or hear about it, that we as parents and caregivers sit down and talk to them about it and make sure to focus on the side of it where there was healing and rescue and support and help. Otherwise, they can stay in a state of traumatic shock and kind of hopelessness and um, grief from it, which is gonna be a piece of this as well, but it's important that they also know and see the, uh, the healing side of things that can happen after this. Which are what? What are some exercises? Yeah, absolutely. So talking to them about um, the role of doctors, um, pastors, church leaders, um, the role of counselors and people that are here to be able to help heal from things like this and that we can um, move forward together both collectively and at an individual level depending on you know at the individual level what is needed for that individual that's suffering from it and then bigger solutions overall i mean there's more discussion about mental health now in the last few years and than i could ever recall it was kind of a thing that people talked about either in silos or mm -hmm. away from the light and now there's an open dialogue about people's need to get help if they need help what are some larger solutions? 
So I think if I'm being completely honest with you, um, it's a little bit frustrating because okay. there are so many knowledgeable experts out there that have solutions that would help and that would work. I'm certainly not saying that um, it would fix all and prevent all this from happening. We live in a broken world. Mm -hmm. And so a part of that is gonna be understanding that evil exists and it happens. But I think on the other side of it, there's experts who know what we can do, but I would rather flip the dialogue to why is it not happening? Mm. What, why are these solutions either not being implemented or not working? Because we spend a lot of time talking about them, but we don't ever see them come into action. And so I think that as a community, it would really help if we could actually see these solutions being implemented, then follow them and see what works. Well, give me an example you know? of some of the solutions, some things yeah. that we could be doing that we're not doing. Definitely. So I think it's first going to start with a table of experts coming together, which, by the way, could be happening. But again, I think we need to be able to see this. Um, a table of experts, but it's important of who is included in that conversation. Not only do we need experts in mental health, we need school professional school leaders involved. Um, we also need church leaders involved, pastors who can impart uh, more wisdom than I think that they're given credit for in these situations. Um, we need an expert to be experts to be able to come together and talk about what can be done. For instance, not only is it going to involve training from on the law enforcement side as well, the school professional side, and then really trying to map out where what is in the in the process is not working. What is it that, what are the barriers to us being able to implement the things that need to be done? On the mental health side, which I could speak more on, um, what, for this one particular case that happened, at what point in his journey did he need mental health support? And was he given it? And if not, why? What was the reason as to why those solutions were not being implemented? A lot of us, you know, that are in my position as mental health, we just see these lack of resources um, across areas that are it's just, it's, it gets frustrating. Well, um, you know, the era of suck it up, toughen up, mm -hmm. that's just life, mm -hmm. it's all gone now. Right. <laughs> it's all gone now. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that, I know for my generation, we were languaged about approaching life. It's just not what you can do to these young people anymore mm -hmm. because they're doing things you can't imagine, committing suicide on social media mm -hmm. live. And acting out, shooting up a school, 18 years old, you're not, mm. you've not seen enough life to believe, for me to believe you can be responsible so, for so much carnage. What advice would you give to someone right now who may be in crisis or on the brink of crisis? That's a great question. I think that if someone is experiencing, um, you know, it, or, or if the others on the outside can witness and see that someone is experiencing symptoms of being in a crisis, then it's reaching out and getting help, making, don't, hesitate call somebody um, and if you don't feel like you've gotten the response that you've wanted call again and maybe call a different person keep calling um, it's something that we actually tell children who are stuck in abusive situations or abuse in, abusive homes never give up keep reaching out keep telling a teacher tell another teacher mm -hmm. keep you know don't give up and continue to reach out for help until you feel like there's help that's been given. I would like you to help me put together a panel of people to have this discussion to where we dedicate the entire show yeah. to that. Yeah. And I'd like to do it in fairly short order because I think the conversation is necessary. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. I would love Fletcher. that, yes. All right, coming up, we're gonna talk about an American hero. It is an amazing story that I can't wait to share. And his partner will be in studio with us as well. Back with more Clay Young Show in just a moment.
So I am very happy to be with you to talk with, <laughs> right on cue, District Attorney Hiller Moore, Mary Haney, and that's Spike right there. Spike is the partner of a hero, local hero, military hero. I heard his story a couple weeks ago at Smoke Him If You Got Him. Jared Haney, Mary is his mother, and of course, our district attorney is here with us, and Spike is excited right on cue. He's just, he knows he's gonna be on television. So, Hiller, um, I want to start with you before we, we talk with Mary. You had a relationship with Mary before we started. Let's talk a little bit about that. So uh, Mary and I worked together as uh, young people at the district attorney's office many, many years ago. And uh, she eventually left the DA's office, but we stayed in touch uh, throughout the years. I uh, knew her family, knew her husband, knew her sons. And I, I met Jared. And uh, Jared joined the Marines, and my dad was a Marine, and kind of formed a bond with him. And then when I learned the story about Jared, when he unfortunately came back from Afghanistan, uh, he was blown up three and four times Afghanistan, along with Spike, who was blown up. And the last time, he could not go any further. So they took him out of the Marine Corps uh, in the hospital for two months, brought him back, but was separated from Spike. Mm. And then that's how the story began with Mary and Mary trying to reunite her son, who has all these battlefield injuries with this uh, Amazing, also a hero yeah. of a dog mm -hmm. that saved so many marine lives in Operation Enduring Freedom. And then, uh, unfortunately, uh, he was buried two weeks ago where he, uh, he died as a result of combat-related uh, injuries that he was received. And this is a uh, kind of a love triangle with a very good story. And then, unfortunately, with Jared's passing, a, a bad story. But surely uh, in time for Memorial Day. Yeah. I mean, we just got a chance to honor the sacrifices of so many Americans from around the country. And Mary, you have to be so proud of your son and his sacrifice to the country and, um, and being able to tell his story because it's inspiring yeah. for people to hear that. And as you just heard in our conversation about the negativity that's out there, I think when people hear about young people who decide to do what he did and, and make such a great sacrifice, it, got, it has to fill you with some pride to think about that he's always going to be remembered. It does. Um, for you reuniting Jared with Spike, that's a great story. You told that story at our event. Tell that story. Uh, okay. Jared had been home from the re Marines for like two and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, had been going through a lot of depression, um, trying to get himself back on track with the culinary school, but he always spoke of Spike. Yeah. His best friend, I mean, they were inseparable and, and just remarked on him all the time. So I decided I was going to, um, he's a little spoiled. Mm -hmm. I was going to try to, uh, to find Spike. So I reached out to um, uh, some fellow Marine friends of mine and did a little research. Long story short, we were running to dead ends. That's when um, Rob Barrow, who's a colonel in the Marines, yeah. retired. Uh, from St. Francisville. Anyway, uh, he had come across an organization called Boots and Collars. Mm -hmm. They were on Facebook. So he, um, they reached out and asked if I put it on space Facebook and I oh. agreed, um, but I didn't want him to know what I was doing. So mm -hmm. they put it on Facebook. By the next morning, I had had an email from the Colonel of the Police Chief of the Virginia State Capitol. Mm -hmm. Said, I have your dog. He has a tattoo in his ear. Okay. So uh, they knew he had his dog. Uh, so anyway, I went in there and I told Jared, I said, well, I hope you're not upset with me. And he said, what did you do? <laughs> so I showed him the email post and uh, he said, did you find Spike? And I said, I did. But um, they've already promised him to the other dog handler, we can fly up there if you would like to go see him. He said, yeah, absolutely. Can we go tomorrow? Mm -hmm. So we flew up. Uh, they had a big um, reuniting of Jared with a, uh, on the state capitals, uh, uh, on the streets <laughs> of the state capitol. I know, buddy. Uh, so we flew up. Ever since Jared's been gone, I've had him a lot. Yeah. And he was, anyway, so we flew up and had a, a, a big ceremony, and they just like they had never skipped a beat. It's so amazing to think about that and all the people involved with it. And, uh, you know, in the process, in that last last few years, him being able to reunite with Spike and the, and the way it goes, I don't think people think about the bond, Hiller, that these military officers have with their partners, these Which service animals. It's not only the animals, it's the partners that they have during war themselves amongst people. But then add to that, this dog, this dog not only served Jared in the country, but after Jared's injury, went to another military officer. And he continued looking at finding bombs sure. that saved so many Marine lives. Yeah. And then following that, went to the Virginia State Capitol where he sniffed out potential bombs at that capital. So he served uh, 
He served the career. He's a sergeant in the Marine Corps. He's a sergeant in the Marine Corps. Sergeant. <laughs> So does yes. the spike stay there <clears throat> now? Yes, he does. Yeah, yeah. He does. You know, I, I was thinking about this. We were talking at the event, and I, as you were telling the story, and when, because Jared came back and was here 11 years before passing away, and that there are so many members of our military who are still moving <clears throat> around right now, and their partners are still here. Do you think we talk about them enough in, in terms of the ones who are still here with us versus just those who were fallen? No, I don't. Uh, they suffer a lot of injuries. <clears throat> Mentally, physically, you know. Uh, Jerry had four counts of traumatic brain injury, and he was not the same child or adult but when he, from when he came back. Well, we're going to take a quick break. You know, again, it's television. Spike didn't make a noise before we started. We get into the segment, and he's talking to us back with Hiller and Mary in just a moment. Guys. Suddenly, I have a strange feeling of what Art Linkletter felt like so many times <laughs> doing this show. As we're here during commercial break, and Spike has been so verbal, he's a good boy. You know, we were talking in the break about this, and this is a subject I think people will resonate with, and that is what isn't being done for veterans who have returned home. So, Hiller, obviously, as a veteran and, and someone who is connected to people both here and in Washington because of the work you do, and I'll start with you before Mary. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a subject we should be talking about more, right? Well, you know, I was never able to be a veteran. I, I have, my well, your family was. was. Yes, yeah. uh, but you can see on his uh, belt here, not all disabilities are visible. Mm -hmm. And veterans are proud people, as I've come to know, and they don't want to let you know they're hurting. They don't want that to stand on their way. Uh, but you, you were there smoking when you got him. And look, thanks for doing that. Thanks. That meant so much. My pleasure. I brought uh, a friend of mine there who was a Vietnam veteran. And he had never been welcomed home before. Man, Some people had emotional. told him, thanks for your service, but no yeah. one ever said, welcome back. Yeah. In fact, he was told, don't wear your uniform flying back into Baton Rouge because people will spit on you, they'll talk about you. And he said, as a young man, 20 years old, coming back from Vietnam, I just served my country, right. risked my life, and this is how I'm going to be treated in my own country. So we don't do enough to just, first of all, thank them and welcome them back home, but uh, to try to recognize the pain and the suffering that they're going through because it's unique. It's just like you talked about in the previous segment, what's going through children's minds right now, mm -hmm. the stress and the trauma they have just from what they see. Think about these people that are in actual battle, fighting others with live weapons, heavy weapons, uh, seeing people killed in horrible ways. Uh, and But not all veterans die on the battlefield. Right. Some die back at home like Jared, Jared. because of the lingering effects of that. And we need to recognize that and do more for them. So, Mary, if you had an audience 
with people in Washington, D.C. about oh. this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and keep in mind, we're on television. So <laughs> um, what would you say? Oh, uh, I, I think there needs to be more support for the veterans that are coming back. Um, uh, this sounds a little harsh, but I think their answer is just to throw more medicine, throw more medicine, throw more medicine at them is all they want to do. Uh, they just don't receive the support, in, in my opinion, just like Jared was having seizures, the doctor at the hospital said he needed to see the neurologist. I personally called the VA and asked about a neurology appointment. They said, oh, he's got one in three weeks, he's gonna have to wait. Mm -hmm. I explained, no, the doctor said he needs to see him. They said, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. Wow. So. And I've heard stories like that for so long, as Hiller knows, knows he's been to so many of these events that we do uh, every year, the, the one that you were at. It kind of started with wanting to raise money to support the organizations that are working with veterans and their families. Because I think people assume, because you see the big organizations, the wounded warriors, that you know, all of them have money. A lot of them don't. No. And they're touching veterans around the country, black, white, male, female, Hispanic, Jew, whatever. There, there's, there's a mosaic of people who've defended this country and other lands. And I do think we should prioritize helping them when they come back. Here. I agree. And I don't know why it takes so long to get that across to people. Uh, final thoughts. If people want to learn more about Jared's story, there's information out there. You sent me a couple of stories. What do you say, Hiller? I mean, it's just so easy. If you just put Jared Heine uh, in, you know, the, your computer, it's going to pop up uh, good stories. And so, I mean, the stories are really good about him reuniting with uh, Spike and uh, just the service that they've given to our country. This is a homegrown hero from Baton Rouge. And... I know we have a lot more than just only Jared, but Jared's just the last, but uh, we should be proud of what these people have done. Mary, thank you so much for being thank on you with for us. Having thank me. you, Hiller. Thank Appreciate you, Spike. And thank you to Mel, our, our resident veteran yep. who's here yep. with us in studio. And yes, I actually did say something nice about Mel on camera. <laughs> I'm going to have to uh, go and see somebody about that after the show is over. See you next week. You guys have a great weekend, and God bless Jared and all of the men and women who've sacrificed so much for our great country.